Hi, everyone. Welcome. We'll get started in a minute or so as more people join in. Um, but in the meantime, as I see more and more participants join in, let us know where you're calling from or where you're viewing from and uh, who you are. So we can see all the, the global soccer fans or football fans today. Bonjour, Frederick. Welcome, Liam. Lucas from Poland, welcome. Christoph from Hungary, welcome, Juan and, and Enrique from Mexico. Argentina, Daniel, congratulations on your, your country's win of Copa. Welcome, Ajay from India. Ian from Wales. Wow, we've got a, a very global team today. We certainly have. We've definitely got some uh, Mexico, Argentina fans out there. Indeed. Champion <laughs> <laughs> de America, y Piera, uh, Maradona, y Messi. Welcome, Hugo. Love it. Yeah, lo loving the shirts. Indeed. I think football football kits are the best uh, sporting jerseys in any sport, just for the designs and the creativity of all of them. But uh, just, we'll, go ahead. I was just going to say it's good workwear, personally. Agreed. Welcome, Marco, from Finland. We'll get started in a, a minute or two um, once a few more participants join in. <laughs> I like that one. Leicester winning the Premier League without ever possessing the ball. <laughs> Correct. They did. Um, they were very good at counterattacking and Jamie Vardy putting the ball in the back of the net. That was about, yeah, it was a good season. <laughs> Ted Lasso fans, let's go. So a great show. Welcome, Blair. Cool. I think we have a good number in here, Brendan. Should we, uh, should we get started? Yeah, let's kick it off. Um, so a quick introduction of myself before I, I pass it over to Abby. I'm Brendan Doyle from our Oracle Analytics product strategy team, and I'll be your host for today's analytics and data tech cast, which will be kicking off immediately after a brief introduction. Uh, for a little background, I'm a senior product manager overlooking Oracle Analytics Cloud, Oracle Analytics Server, and Fusion Analytics Warehouse. And I've been actively engaged with the analytics and data Oracle user community for about two years now. And I've enjoyed volunteering both as a, a host and a speaker and a content provider. and kind of an all-around hype man for the, the great sessions that ANDOUC provides around analytics and data storytelling. So um, also extra credit points for anyone in attendance that can guess uh, clubs that Abby is wearing or the uh, the jersey that I'm wearing from AC Milan, if you can guess the player. Just extra credit points there as well. Close, it is not Juventus, um, but let us know in the chat. Um, but to introduce Abby really quickly in the session that we'll cover today, um, Abby will be our, our speaker, Abby Giles Haig, and she'll be presenting on football or soccer analytics um, and a deep dive around it. Abby has years of experience in delivering award-winning data science in both public and private sector. She has a proven track record of hands-on data science, along with strategic leadership and mentoring of data science teams. And Abby is a strong interpersonal written and verbal communicator who can deliver effective presentations, consult on technology and analytical projects, and drive collaborative relationships through quantitative analysis. She has a track record of delivering global and national machine learning solutions in both health and financial sectors. And if you like data storytelling, you'll love Abby's sessions. Today's session will be recorded and will be available on the TechCast page after today's session, as well as on the YouTube channel. If you search with hashtag AND underscore TechCasts. Also, a PDF will be loaded onto the ANDOUC page after the call. Um, after regulation time completes, we'll head to penalty kicks where Abby will help host the Q&A and answer any of your questions about what's shared today but please use the Q&A for questions and the chat for letting us know the teams and where you're calling in from. Um, now for our past uh, and future tech casts, our next one up to bat is on August 5th for Oracle Machine Learning Services 
for real-time scoring in digital process automation, where Ralph Mueller will be presenting. And our previous one was on July 8th for graph, graphs of machine learning cybersecurity, where Meli and Amali and Rachik Patra presented, and that can be found on demand on ANDRUC's website. And for everyone on today's call, um, if you have knowledge, expertise, or any tips or tricks that you want to share around analytics, machine learning, or graph and spatial, we highly encourage you to submit your TechCast abstract proposals so that the TechCast committee can review them, select the best ones, and slot you in for an opportunity to get on the virtual stage, as we'd love to hear from you. So please head to analyticsanddatasummit.org slash techcasts if you'd like to submit your abstract. The next slide, please. And if you want to uh, flex your tech side, we have a lot of swag and merch on the ANDOUC page. Um, what you're seeing on the far left side, the coffee cup um, hits on the paranormal distribution, but it'll show the ghost once you pour the, the hot coffee or tea into it. So um, an interactive cup in a way and a lot of other great merch that's out there as well. So I encourage you to check it out. Um, we would love for you to, to stay connected with our community as well. Um, the analytics and data oral community has a lot of ways to connect with product experts like Abby, product teams from Oracle and customers as well. So you can join our, our Slack channel to join the general community channels or direct message any of the, the experts within. Also, you can check out our newsletter for up-to-date announcements on events and different best practices. And also follow us on the social medias of LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook just to stay up-to-date with the community. Now, lastly, before I, I kick the ball over to, to Abby to start the session, um, we'd also uh, love for you to, to uh, save the date for the fall sessions of our TechCast days that'll run from October 12th to October 14th. Each day has a dedicated session for machine learning, spatial and graph, and analytics. But now, uh, without further ado, I'd like to kick the ball to Abby and uh, start her session. So over to you, Abby. Thanks, Brendan. Um, hello, everyone from around the world. It's great to have you here. Um, I'm very quickly going to do the the boring, dry company stuff, and then we'll delve into the world that I love, which is football or soccer analytics. Uh, so Vertice, who are we? We are a platinum um, partner with Oracle. We do Oracle-only technology. We've been around for around 10 years now. We've got a few Oracle awards. Our latest one was in 2020. We picked up the Autonomous Database Partner of the Year for UK and Ireland. We work with clients from the US through to Europe. Um, we're headquartered out of Dublin. Um, but as you can tell from my accent, I'm here in uh, England. Uh, so we do kind of distribute ourselves around the globe. We work um, across verticals um, and we have lots of success stories and um, as we see it, analytics cuts across verticals. So we have everything from retail, technology, um, so really do uh, diverse kind of analytics for, for customers. So Brendan did an awesome intro on me. So um, this slide probably not even needed, but I kind of want just to touch on a few little key points just before we get started. And um, so I do have a PhD in artificial intelligence and um, it's computational modeling of the human heart. And that kind of gives you an idea of the kind of person I am. I have all sorts of different backgrounds. I'm an Oracle ACE director. So I'd love to work with Oracle, try and, try and out the new tech um, and, and kind of working with them on, on testing things out. The other one is um, where I kind of specialize. Uh, I do a lot in fraud analytics. I do a little bit in customer insight. And then um, the passion side is really through the sports analytics, um, which is what you're going to see today. Finally, I'm also the first team manager of Walls End Women's. Um, so here in Newcastle upon time, we have a team called Walls End. It's a small community team um, trying to hit the big time, trying to break into the National League. And I became first team manager about 12 months ago as the pandemic hit. And um, so it was, it was a rough time to become a first team manager, but it was really where my passion kind of met my analytics. And I was like, how can I bring the two worlds together without costing a fortune? You know, this is a grassroots team. We don't have a lot of money. So how can I bring the two worlds together? So what we're gonna go through today is essentially the start of that project um, and to set expectations um, the challenge was, could I do all of this analytics for less than $500 or £500? And um, so the whole thing had to be, you know, lean, mean, kind of fighting machine sort of uh, work. Um, and it, it had to deliver the analytics so that they're actionable every single session. 
I only have the team for 90 minutes per week. Uh, and in fact, after this session, I'm diving straight out the door to start coaching again. So, um, you know, that's kind of sets the scene. So the architecture that this is built on is um, we have our data sources. Um, in today's presentation, you're going to see some structured and unstructured data sets. We're using an autonomous data warehouse. I'm using the free one. So the autonomous free, um, so 20 gigabytes. We're not talking big, bulky servers, really kind of lean. I'm using the Oracle Data Science Platform, OCI. Um, and then uh, for the start of this project, I've used OAC just to get off the ground on the analytics and do a bit of machine learning. Um, but it, ultimately, that analytics can either stay in OAC or it may move into Apex in the ADW as, as the project matures. A few little tips if you do want to try this out um, later on. Um, if you do use the Oracle A. OCI for doing the kind of video analytics. There are a few little tweaks you want to put in there. So, um, for example, you're going to need uh, OpenCV Python. You're going to need to make sure you can um, push in uh, the, the videos, etc. So you do need to kind of um, add a few extra um, OpenGL utility tools and, and visualization tools to process the videos. Um, and then the second point is that you do need to do the connection to so the Oracle um, connection into the database. So just a few little setup points. If you want to replicate this, you can. Uh, and that ultimately, at the end of this project, um, I'm going to make all of this code available on GitHub. So it really is a community project in that I'm giving it back into the community so that other grassroots teams across the globe can essentially do analytics uh, in Oracle. So let's go to what my business question was. Like we observe a game either live or on a video, but we, how do we quantify that game? Like what's the obvious one is like score lines, so a number of goals, but actually when we break it down, it's the number of passes or the number of shots. It's the average place you were on the pitch. Were you an attacking team or were you the defending team? How many passing channels? So who did, who passed to who was the, uh, center half always passing to the left back or was the center half passing to the center mid you know where are those those passing channels so that we know how the team are reacting and, and playing does it differ first half versus second half um, and also how can we use that to predict how we're going to do in future games you know all of this is really these are the key business questions if we were looking at it in that way that we're essentially trying to answer so we're gonna give you a kind of part one um, and then a part two. So the reason there's a part one is essentially when I started this project, I was thinking, great, I've got a full season. I'm gonna collect loads of data and, and kind of videos and I can kind of program and, and teach the machine learning. And then obviously COVID hit and our season was abandoned. So we actually only played six games last year. Um, before we actually got shut down here in the UK and, and, and our season abandoned. So I was like, well, I don't want the project to stop and stall. So how can I get around it for now until I can kind of connect all the pipe work together? So for the first part and the demonstration of the kind of dashboards that, and the analytics that you can get out of this, um, essentially I'm going to use the um, English Women's Super League 2018-2019 seasons. And we're going to look at the, the dashboards um, that you can produce once you've got um, the actual data organized. So to demonstrate that, the best place, uh, in my opinion, is in Oracle Analytics Cloud. So here you can see that um, we have the teams, number of shots um, in open play. We can drill down. So we're just going to look at Man City here. And we can look at who took those shots in the season. So then we can de delve into the actual fixtures. So we can look at the score line. We can look at when they played, who was the referee. We can look at the passing. So number of passes by the season, who did the most passes? Was it the left back, goalkeeper? Again, drill down to Man City and have a look at them. Well, actually it was the right back and left back at Man City that did the most passes um, compared to other teams. So we can see that season next to season. So you can start to build up this um, picture. Now, this one is really cool because this is the average position of a player on a soccer pitch or on a soccer field. And you can see that we've got Manchester City here for the 2018 season and the 2019 season. But actually, we can drill further and we go match ID and look at a specific match. And I know that that match is when Man City 
um, played Everton. So now we can add Everton and Manchester City to the, to the picture, and we can see that Man City were actually further up the pitch than Everton were, and therefore probably the more dominant team. And that then leads us to look at things like this. This is a passing network. So here we're, we're going to delve into the passing network in a minute, but also you can do it as heat maps. So you can really do so many different visualizations to tell the story to different audiences and different people. So for example, those statistics on the left back, right back and the descriptive analytics might be really useful for um, say a performance analyst, you know, who's going to be doing the most work during the game. But the passive network, that's far more interesting um, for a coach like myself to know if I've got a certain pattern of play, are the players effectively doing it or not? And if I'm looking at that, then I'm looking at, you know, is there a, a weak cog in our passing network? Is there someone who maybe isn't responding as well? And we can kind of go through that um, again in training. We can look to sharpen it up. So once you've got that, um, you can then essentially really drill down and just do it on one team. So we've got all teams, all shots, etc. cetera. Um, and the data structure behind that is quite messy. So obviously, like I say, this was first first stab at this, the first like lot of data um, kind of coming in. Um, and I had like match events, I had past completion as a, as a stored um, part of the ADW, the overall matches, I had a training data set and a test data set because we're going to go into some machine learning. So the one that I'm going to just highlight at the minute is that top one, that past completion. So that pass completion is that passing network. And essentially that's something you can't really do that easily in either the ADW or OAC. So this is where Python really kind of plays its part. So the passing network, when we break it down, essentially looks like this. So you have the number of passes completed between player A and player B, and you look at their average location on the pitch. The size of the line and the circle is the num it indicates if, if it's bigger and, and darker that it, they've done more passes. So if we look at Man City's um, one against Everton here, we can see that Steph Horton and Jennifer Beatty pass the ball to each other on a, a semi-regular basis. But then you can see that there's actually a centre mid in Caroline Weir that is, um, she's definitely kind of a, a hub player that's involved in the passing network from Man City's perspective. So if I now think of this as a coach or a manager and I'm the Everton manager, I might look at this analysis and say, if I want to affect Man City and I want to affect the way they build up their play, the players I need to be looking at or looking to um, influence are probably Caroline Weir. So can I get someone close to her during a game to affect her, to maybe nullify her, to maybe man mark her out of the game? So essentially, we're looking at this kind of passing network to A, look at opposition players. So looking at how can I affect Man City? But we're also looking at passing networks in terms of here, I could probably tell you that Man City's um, pattern of play goes from a fullback into a centre half, into the centre mid, and then out to a forward player. That would be their rough pattern of play. So if I then see in a game that actually Steph Horton, instead of hitting Caroline Weir, is actually hitting Nikita Paris a lot more, I might think, okay, Steph's not doing the pattern that I, I asked for in training. So this is all feedback to players um, that we can show them after a game and say, this is what your passing network looked like. Do you understand how it, it, it is or it isn't what we kind of went through in the training session? So how do we develop that? Well, this is where OCI and Python come in. Um, and you can see here that we, we kind of uh, selecting the data from the database. We're going to kind of go into how that data gets into the database um, in the second half of this presentation. But in this first part, we're essentially um, preparing the data. So you can see for the, the data that I've used here for the WSL, I've actually taken it from somewhere called StatsBomb. So StatsBomb has the data available for free for the WSL. And um, so I've been using that um, to kind of replicate what the system is going to look like and set up my um, data structures for the future. And um, so using that, that's essentially where, where we get that. And once that's um, done and completed, Essentially, you build up um, the positions, the number of passes, aggregate it all up, um, and then you print out and save this figure into a, a plot. 
Now that plot, that figure, it says um, it's a plot in, uh, and there I'm just doing that so you can visually see it. But essentially what that does is in the background, it saves that as a blob into the database and it's tagged with the match ID and the teams involved. And that essentially then enables me to pull it through to OAC later on. So that's where kind of OCI Python and, and the ADW kind of come together is that we use that Python to develop the image, but then the image is stored back into the ADW and pulled through on the OAC. So that's just one area. That's the descriptive analytics. At this point, I'm not actually doing essentially much data science. Well, I am in, in the sense of I'm doing qualitative analysis of my data. I'm understanding what kind of data I have available. I'm telling the data story. I'm trying to find patterns within the data. The next step from that is actually, could I use that data to predict who would win a game? Who who might I win? So if I'm the Man City manager, how many games am I going to win? What's the, um, is it predicted um, that it'll be a big loss or a small loss? That might give me an idea on players that I can rest or if I need to maybe concentrate on a specific game because actually the prediction is I'm going to lose it. So how can I affect that game? And this is where we go into the world of supervised and unsupervised learning. And today we're going to go supervised. So we're going to look at um, match results. So from the historic data of the WSL, so we have the 2018-2019 season's data, could I predict the 2021 season's home win, draw, or away win? So instead of it uh, binomial, it, it, we're going to go for a multi-dimensional kind of win. And look, what we're looking for is targeting winnable games. So ones where the machine learning thinks, um, yeah, this is, this is spot on. You know, we really think you're going to win this one. Caveats, major caveats. Um, some people have asked me in the past, like, could you use this to do fantasy football or like putting on a bet and stuff like that? Yes, you could. And there's lots of people out there that do that. And, and I'm not saying it's not possible, but what it doesn't account for is new players, new managers, and that wonderful one called the weather. <laughs> you would be amazed on how many people's uh, footballing changes when the weather changes. Uh, I think if you look at even the Olympics uh, the other day, a lot of players um, saying that it was really hot on the evenings out there um, and, and it does change the way teams set up. They're probably more conservative, maybe not pressing as high. And that means that they've changed their style of play. So something you may, might not be able to account for in your machine learning algorithms. So the data we have is that um, we have the, the case ID or the game, the match date, the month day, which season, the team, home score, away score, and, and essentially I've tagged it then with the results. So if it's nil-nil, draw, um, zero-one, away win. So we're going to train on that results column. Um, and essentially, if you look at it in, in the sense of what we're doing, we're in this last bit, we're going to train, evaluate, and feedback. This data collection and data preparation is the bit we haven't delved into, so that's part two of the presentation. So we're just going to focus on, assume that data is already in the database, so we've got all those that information on passing networks, we've got all that information on um, who played, how many minutes, where they were on the pitch, etc. So we've got that data and we're going to essentially train a machine learning algorithm to say whether we would win a game or not. And the classic way to do this is you can set up a train data and a test data. So from the 18-19 season, use about 80% of that to train on and then sample, uh, use the minus function to get the test data so the other 20. Uh, the Oracle database has this function called sample 80, so it'll sample 80% of that table. And if you use the seed function, it means that you can replicate this um, in the future. And I always say this is like a menu. Uh, if you're going into a restaurant, essentially you've got lots of different um, things that you can pick. So um, prep auto is a really cool feature in the Oracle database. Um, it will um, deal with nulls, it'll hot encode for you, it'll um, do mean and, or median averages for you if, if you have any data missing, um, it'll deal with any null values, etc. Then essentially you say dot create model two, you give the model a name, you tell its classification, tell it where it's pulling the data from, so in this case it's football train. The case ID is the unique, so that's the, if you like, the match ID. Um, and then the match result where we're asking it to train on away win, home win, or draw. 
once you've done that, you essentially are good to go. So you can then apply the, the machine learning. If you're not at that level of wanting to write PL SQL, can I point you in the direction of the new AutoML experiments in the ADW? So this is a new feature that's come out and essentially it's a GUI that does it for you. So you create an experiment. So here we're gonna create the football prediction experiment. We tell it which table the data's in. So find the, the football train data. You click OK, and then essentially you need to tell it which field it needs to learn. So the match results, so home win, away win, et cetera. And then tell it which one's the unique ID, so case ID. Um, I kind of called it that so that um, it kind of all joined up. Once you've done that, you hit either faster results or better accuracy. That's it. Like instead of having to write the, the PL SQL now, you have this ability with a GUI, the auto ML feature will, will essentially do it for you. As that runs, essentially you'll get a leaderboard of um, results coming out. So this will um, fill up with the algorithms, how accurate it is, and it will rank them. And you'll, uh, by the time you finish this, you'll have lots of different algorithms in here. The reason this is so cool is that it will do things like um, feature, it will try different features, it will try different algorithms, it will um, really test them out and, and really give you lots of different metrics as well once, you, once you've got to that point. So if you do use the auto ML, once you, um, sorry, that's repeating itself. Once you've done it, this is the result you get out. So you get um, a leaderboard, you get your, so here the neural network, um, the model names there, and, and it's very accurate result. Essentially, once you've got to that point, you can then, um, you can look at what the experiment settings were, but you can also pick one of the models to go and apply to your test data. Um, and so what I mean by that is, in this case, we want to predict the 2021 results. So you can essentially look at this, decide which one you're happy with, and then once you've got to that point, you create a notebook that's going to apply that model onto your, the data that you want to predict. And that's it. That it now takes away a lot of that PL SQL work that would have been, you know, create a settings list, create a model, apply the model, etc. That's kind of taken away from you and you can do it through the auto ML process. So if you haven't given it a shot, give it a shot. There's lots of cool stuff in there. Um, and once you've done it, you can essentially pick that model and bring it through to the Zeppelin notebook in the ADW and you can write in Python or PL SQL here in the ADW. So really recommend that if you've not had a shot at it. I'm going to flick through. So let's have a look at what the model predicted and, and therefore like how well it's done. So here's what the result, the matches for the 2021 season. So here you can see Aston Villa versus Man City, uh, Tottenham Hotspurs versus West Ham, Bristol versus Everton, etc. And the prediction, away win and probability 90% or a home win 45%. So if I'm looking at this and I'm the Tottenham Hotspurs manager, I might look at that and say, okay, it's predicting a home win against West Ham, but actually it's not that confident that I am going to go and get a home win. So here, this might be as a manager, I might delve into that data to look at why it's not as confident. Like, what's the key attributes that have, have knocked it down or, or up? Um, we're not going to kind of delve into that today, but it kind of gives you an idea of what you can use this for and, and, and things like that. But if you look at, if I'm the Man City manager and I'm looking at the Brighton game, it's a draw and it's 100%. Like, again, how can I affect that game? How can I get a goal against Brighton, etc.? So how well did I do? Well, actually, not that bad. And the ones that you didn't do that well on actually had the lowest probability scores. So Tottenham Hotspur's home win 45%, it actually was a 1-1 draw with West Ham. And Manchester United against Chelsea, um, the prediction was it's going to be a home win to Manchester United. Again, it was a 1-1 draw. So you can see that the ML from the auto ML actually did really, really well on predicting these games. There are other ones um, that I'll kind of draw your attention to. Um, so things like um, home win for Reading, uh, uh, sorry, Arsenal against Reading, you know, it was 100% confident. And actually it was a 6-1 scoreline. So I can see 
the, the, the scoreline really does reflect what the um, machine learning came up with. So really good results from the neural network. Now I'm going to pause there because like this is all, this all sounds amazing. Like this is easy. I mean, all the data is in the database. We're just doing normal machine learning and, and kind of we're looking at some cool pictures and we're doing some data descriptions and things like that. And yeah, great. We've got a data story, but there's a bigger part of this problem um, that if you sit back and think about is how did I get that data into the database? Now, during the pandemic, obviously I've used the WSL data, but now we're coming back out of the pandemic and, and kind of we're getting back into football. We're starting to record the, the games again. There is a question mark on how do we do that data collection and data preparation? So what I mean by that is you and me, we will go watch a game and we can say, you know, so-and-so did 50 passes and, and things like that, but there are 22 players on the pitch all in different locations on the pitch. They can score from a corner. They could score from a free kick. There's a lot of observational data that we gather just from being at a game. And that is very much the unstructured data. And what we want to do is process that unstructured data and get it into the database so that it's nicely structured to do that descriptive analytics we've just gone through. So the question is, how do we get from unstructured to structured? How do we process that data? Now, traditionally that capturing would be done by human labeling. So we utilize um, gaming theory, so rewards or game consoles, where we you can see from that picture, the combination of buttons would record who on the pitch has passed or, or been tackled, et cetera. But that requires time. It's a lot of training. And I'm not gonna be able to get someone to come to every world's own game and essentially sit and record in this manner how my game's gone um, and there's lots of different companies can do that there are different if you look at sports like basketball and essentially to kind of build up what i did i looked at papers from different sports and one of them that stood out to me was basketball where there was a combination of cameras above the court um, and you could then see all of the players on the court at, at different times and the players are, can sometimes wear GPS trackers. And um, so you have the visual input from the video and then you have the GPS tracker as well. And you therefore have um, both location data from the GPS trackers, but also then the visual from the cameras. And you can use the AI and ML to detect players and equipments and areas and things like that. And I thought, spot on, this is, this is more in the direction that, that I wanna go. Essentially, I'm gonna have a camera recording the game and then I want to take that and, and transform it into database, um, into structured data in the database. So this is where we bring in deep learning, so image processing. The videos are simply lots of images um, that have been sliced and put together. So off, one of the first things I, uh, we've had to experiment with is how often do we extract the frames out and, and, and cause it to become a picture? Um, and that's something I'm still tinkering with and, and training with at the minute. Then essentially we need to train a machine learning model. We need to apply it to the video and then extract the results out to the database. So the first question is how do we detect players? So usually as myself and Brendan kind of displayed today is the shirts tend to be different colors. Uh, so red and blue, or in my case, black and white stripes and the ball is color and size. So usually it's white and it's small and you're looking for that. And then to detect the pitch, you're looking for the white lines um, and then the green surface. Um, but again, one of the questions is that we see everything in 3D. So we're going to have to extrapolate that out to 2D um, to store it in the database. So labeling players. So this is the arduous part of all of this. Um, is you can label players like this. So here I'm using video from... Um, just some video you can download so you can label the Chelsea players who are in blue and the Manchester City players are in that um, wonderful yellow and orange way kit. Um, and I will admit I use this video because the colours are so uniquely different to each other um, and it, it was a way to build up the training um, of the machine learning algorithm to start with. So here we're labelling Man City, Chelsea players etc and we keep doing that on, on quite a lot of frames from the video. So at the minute, I think I, uh, on this 
um, sweep, I think I had to train something in the region of two to 300 frames of video in this manner to kind of help the machine learning um, algorithm understand what it's looking for. So in the background, every single time I've drawn a box around it, it's tagging in XML what that is. So is it a, a Man City player, a Chelsea player, or the ball? So you can see here, I'm tagging that as being the ball, and then I'm tagging another one um, and saying that that's the, the Chelsea player. If I just skip the video forward a bit um, and go through, you can see here that even the goalkeepers had to be tagged because they're in a different color. Um, how do I tell the machine learning algorithm? Actually, there could be four color jerseys on the pitch. You've got the Man City outfield, Man City goalkeeper, Chelsea outfield, and Chelsea goalkeeper. So you really have to think about the kind of range of frames that you're going to label so that you can get a good breadth of knowledge for the machine learning algorithm. So that's that kind of gives you an idea of, of one way of doing the labeling. So once I've done that labeling, and, and I'm going to show the demo here on England versus USA women, um, and, and apologies, um, this is nothing to do with the Olympics that was on the other day. This, this was just because I'm a, a women's football fan. Um, so this is the original video. So here, USA are in blue and England are in red. And this is from the She Believes Cup. Um, so it's the BBC footage. So this is the original footage before we put the machine learning algorithm on top of it. And as you can see, it's just a standard video. Um, in this case, it's, it's a moving camera because it's, it's broadcaster image. Um, but you get the gist. This is the original video. So once we've trained it up using that labeling, we've got a machine learning model that now knows how to detect players and balls. Essentially, we can then get to a point where we get, I'm hoping, oh. sorry, yeah. So this is where I just, I'm, I'm helping it a little bit here by telling it the array for red and white, et cetera. You can do this. If you do it on the OCI, it'll save each frame out into a folder um, and, and crop it out. So then you get this. Sorry, this is the video I wanted to show you. As you can see, it's bounding each of the players. So it gets it wrong sometimes. The referee is apparently playing for England, um, but it is on, on the whole bounding the players in a box and picking out players from um, the video. So we can pick out the USA players and we can pick out the England players. Um, and you saw there in the Python, I did help it out a little bit during the, the kind of training stage by saying blue colors are in this range, red colors are in this range. Um, and for example, the change on this might be to add yellow for referee um, and, and say not to include kind of thing. And um, so that was kind of the first stage of that. Once we've got that, the biggest challenge is, yes, we can bound a player and we can say that's a player, that's England, that's USA, and we can do that. But it's that concept of how do you go from the 3D picture that we see and mapping it onto 2D. And this is where something called homography matrices come in. So the picture you see at the top, you can see that we're identifying with the red lines, essentially the out, outline of the, um, the soccer pitch or the soccer um, area. Um, and then using a transformation and a homography to change that 3D picture down onto a 2D picture. So once we've been able to detect players and then detect where they are on the pitch based on picking out the lines of the pitch and using that homography, we're able to plot each player from each frame of the video and essentially save that into the database. Now, I couldn't I couldn't see that happening and I'm quite a visual person. So I ended up creating, again, got this idea from, um, from a basketball example, but you track it as it's watching the video, track where it's seeing the players and how the homography is putting that onto the pitch um, and, and then being able to map it onto a visual so I can see it working. And essentially every time I run a video through, it displays this out to me so I can see that it's working, but in the background, it's taking each one of those points and inserting a row into the database to say, you know, USA player detected and, and where on the pitch they are. You England player detected where they are on the pitch. And that then saves into the ADW. So that's how we go from very unstructured video data using the bounding boxes and, and helping it a little bit with the, the kind of color um, 
And then the pitch and the homography matrices to transform that into locations on the pitch, save it into the database. And then essentially you could put the front end analytics on, which is what you saw through the WSL data. So that's kind of where we piece it all together. And I thought I'd give you a view of what it looks like in the grassroots game. So this um, is a Walls End video. Like I said, we're still gathering some more data to do kind of fine tuning of the machine learning algorithms, et cetera. The Walls End are in yellow and Forest Hall are actually in red. Um, so this is grassroots football. This is, um, this is just a, a, a view of what it looks like and it's working every now and again. So the biggest challenge I have here is the position of the camera. It's not always um, easy for the homography and the detection of the players. So you can see it's picking up the football, it's picking up the walls end players um, and the forest hall players and tagging them um, so that I can see that is working. And that is essentially how we've gone from unstructured data to structured data. And more than that, we're actually going to you know, put it together as a pipeline for grassroots football. And I'm going to stop there, Brendan. I think I might have lost a few people along the way. What do you think? I, uh, I think that's fantastic. I think we have a, a few questions as well. Um, I'll start with just the first one from Minaj. Um, what tool was being used to tag the, the players? I think they just missed it. Okay, so that's a label MG. Uh, so it's a Python freely available. You can download it. It take, It's a little bit finicky to install. And so just be careful. I am going to document how to do it and how to install it, especially on OCI, because there was a few tweaks to do. Um, but yeah, it's label MG. You can use it. It's completely free. Awesome. Um, I think the, the other one from Federic is what would you need for the prediction to be even more accurate? Is it more features, more games? Or <laughs> um, definitely more games. Uh, features wise, one area that I'm currently exploring in the WSL data is getting uh, weather data. So weather plays a major part, especially in women's football. Um, it's definitely known to cause problems. Uh, the other one is um, I want one statistic that I don't have in there yet that I want to kind of enrich the data with is how often a team attacks. So uh, somebody brought it up, which is so, totally cool, which is the Leicester team. They barely had the ball, but went on to win the Premier League. And if you look at that, their counter-attacking play was phenomenal. Like it was so fast on how fast they got from their defence to attack. So that tr transition time from defence to attack that's one metric that I haven't managed to get in there yet. And it's one that I'm working on is um, it, there's a real belief um, amongst a lot of coaches that I work with that that transition, especially in grassroots football, is the thing that can make or break a game. So if you can transition quite quickly, either attack into defense or defense into attack, then your team will be, be set up a lot quicker and a lot better. And um, so that's definitely one that I'm working on is, is can I identify those moments in the game where there's a transition or a counter attack. Awesome. Um, for, the, for the next question from Ahmad Mohammed, how do you plan to discern individual players? Ah, so that's the, probably the biggest challenge that I now have. Um, so at the minute, the camera is obviously quite far out. So one option would be to have more cameras around the area. So um, in the corners or at the side of the pitch so that you can put the frames together and look for things like the numbers on the back of the shirt, et cetera. The other one is because I know my team lineup. Um, so as a walls end manager, I'd know who's playing right back, who's playing left back. I can look at the average position and it should pretty much show me the formation I would be expecting to see. And then I could manually like upload a team sheet and say, you know, roughly left back, roughly right back, et cetera. I think where the challenge will come is when I'm playing opposition and I don't have that information. And um, so, yeah, it's a big challenge and it's one that I'm still kind of researching and have different ideas on how to solve. Awesome. Um, and quickly again, will you repeat the, the tool used for tagging? I'll, I'll type it into the chat. Uh, it's label MG, so label L -A -B, MG. label MG, yeah. Label MG, I'll put that into the chat as well. Um, but for the next question, um, let's see. Um, what up for this is from Ra Ravi. What about statistics on substitutions and et cetera? Um, I believe that's one of the key decisions to be made during match time. 
Yeah, that's a really good one. So in the WSL data, it's not actually there, which is quite interesting. Um, but you're right, actually knowing when you made substitutions uh, and what position, etc., especially because substitutions often mean a change in formation. Um, so that's something um, I haven't figured out how I'm going to do that through the video, but um, it's relatively easy during a game just to note down there was a substitution at this point in time and have that as like a, an extra input to the, to the kind of process. Um, it's one that I'm currently working with. So we, we had a game literally the other day we played um, and we made um, substitution. I actually, I'm trying it out at the minute where um, I've made a note of when I've changed the formation and also a substitute. And I'm using the video analysis to see if I can spot the passing networks changing, which would then give me an idea if teams do that as well. Um, so it's definitely, that's a trial and error one at the minute and not a solution. Got it. Um, from the next one from... Arpan Banerjee, um, is it possible to know what neural network architecture is being used for this model? Okay, so um, the, there was two neural networks in the presentation. So the neural network in the first part in the structured data is the one that is in the Oracle Autonomous Database. So OML, um, Oracle Machine Learning. Um, the neural network in there is quite well documented. We can uh, definitely provide links and stuff for that. Um, very cool, very strong, has uh, multiple depths to it. So that's a cool one. In terms of the one for the video, um, I'm using a recurring RCC neural network, um, mainly because of the limited training data set I have. Um, I'm also trialing at the minute uh, YOLO. So you only look once um, as, a, as a kind of, it's a Python uh, machine learning um, that you, it means that I can use less training data, um, especially things like the team colors, the football colors, et cetera. It's really important that I kind of cut down my training time. Awesome. And I think that hits on um, Shabir's question, which was which image processing algorithm are you using, like Bastard RCNN or YOLO? So I think you just said YOLO right yeah, there. So RC, I tried, I was starting out with RCC uh, and now I'm in YOLO. Um, I'm kind of comparing and contrasting the two at the minute to see which one gets the best result. Um, and again, we're going to document that in terms of um, kind of like a little paper on pros and cons of using them. Um, I, at the minute, the winner seems to be YOLO. Um, I get slightly better results out of it. Awesome. Um, for the next question um, from Andrew Gooden, um, what Python package is being used for homography matrices transformation? TensorFlow. TensorFlow, perfect. Um, this is easy. This is like a one-on-one -on -one quiz. <laughs> um, this is from Anan Hit. Um, can you predict results based on the formation, i.e. 523 or a diamond or Ooh. things like that to help uh, your manager? I have not done that one yet. That's one that I would really like to try out at some point. So um, in the WSL data, for example, um, you can pick out, you can see the formations from the passing networks. Um, so what I'm starting to do is like look at them and then tag what the formation is. So as a coach, I can recognize a 4141 or a 532 and, and things like that. So I'm starting to tag the data so that we can see that formation. And, and again, it's one of those extra features that might help the machine learning algorithm. Super. Um, this was another one from Minaj. Um, can we use OAC ML to do the prediction or do we need OCI ML? Uh, so the one that's in the demo here is the ADW OML. So the one in the autonomous database. Uh, I didn't do it in OAC, but um, it really depends on the volume of data. Um, so if you're just going to look at the match results and maybe a few events or aggregated data, absolutely OAC will do it, not a problem. Because I use the event data, I'm talking somewhere in circa two to three million rows. Um, I did it in the database because it's more performant. Um, but really just pick and choose where to do it depending on volume of data and, and things like that. And um, for me, it just works better doing it inside the database. So for the match prediction one, I didn't use OCI at all. I used OML. Awesome. Um, next one from Andrew Carr is on the analytics side, you showed multiple canvases and visualizations. Is there one that you use the most and why? 
Uh, yeah, it's definitely the one, the bubble one on the pitch, um, because it gives me a view of whether the team is quite high up the press, um, so pressing high, so high up the pitch, mid blocks so in the central area, central third of the pitch, or low blocks towards their own goal, and you see it the best in that bubble diagram. Um, so I, I don't think I have many more videos on that one, but on some of them, you can see a team high, high press. And it's so easy to see it on that diagram, uh, on that visual. And it's just amazing. And I'm just like, yeah, that team does a high press. That's really interesting kind of thing. Awesome. Um, this is, I think, specific to you is which camera do you best recommend for filming uh, youth games? Um, so the one that you saw at the end there is uh, we use it, something called VO. Um, and the club has a, a, a VO camera, so it's V-E-O. Um, a lot of grassroots clubs have been going out and getting them over the summer, um, mainly because it's on a stand it's, and it pivots uh, during the game so you can see what's going on. When we actually started out with this project, um, I think if you if I go back on the, on the video, I'll just play and then, right, I'll just pause it there. If you can see there's a stand um, at, the, at the back there where people would normally sit. We actually attached cameras to that to start with, and it was very Billy basic web camera kind of video cameras, so you know, hanging from a building, capturing the game, um, and that's how we started out. So, I guess anything where it's a static camera, you get a full view, um, or if you get a left camera, central camera, right camera, as in the way we did it off the stand, you can cover the whole pitch, and that's the biggest problem is. You need to be able to see the lines of the pitch and you need to be high enough up to see them to be able to use the homography and, and map to 2D. So if you can't see the white lines, you're going to have a problem. Awesome. Um, this one is from Mario Gomez. So how can we approach this kind of job? Um, what do we need to learn in order to, to do what you're doing? Uh, okay, so I guess learning the, the Python bit, um, Again, like I said, I'm going to try and make all of this available on GitHub so people can learn. But if there is interest, then um, Brendan, like I'm game to work with Oracle to kind of write it up, do some 101 kind of Python, like how you get started, load a video, uh, do a little. Um, yeah, I think we should do a, definitely do a blog for this as well and with some videos yeah. attached to it. So, yeah, we should we'll follow up with that on our side to, to get it amplified out for everybody. Yeah, but. Honestly, it's probably you need um, a bit of understanding of Python. There is a little bit of setup on the OCI that, again, I've documented and we're going to make available. Um, and then after that, it, it really is, you can, there's so many different things to look at in this. So, for example, like train it, training it to recognize when it's an offside, training it to understand when there's been a shot on target, um, training it to look at substitutions or who's the player involved. Uh, other areas we're looking at is, um, I was telling Brendan about this, is uh, for player rehab, we're actually going to use a camera to look at their gait analysis, so how they run at the start of the season. And if they have an injury, we can then monitor their gait or the way they run as they recover so that we can monitor it and have an analytics approach to that as well. So all of the players are currently getting recorded for gait analysis um, as well. And, and the, the whole premise of it, it, it's still the same. It's detecting the player, detecting the outside of them, detecting limbs and, and being able to say where they are. So um, in terms of where this can go, there are lots of different avenues. Awesome. Um, then for the next one from Daniel Gomez is how much information in terms of gigabyte size does analyzing a match generate? Um, so the videos themselves for a full match is four gigabytes. Uh, in terms of rows of data, uh, you're in the one to two million rows, roughly speaking. It kind of goes back to what I said of how many frames you want to cut the video into. Um, so the VO is very much high def video, so you've got so many frames. Um, getting started, I'd say take big chunks of it and get the flow of the, the, the system going. Um, so when I started, I was taking a frame every minute um, just to get the pipeline moving. Now I'm probably taking a frame like every half second uh, and, and processing it. Uh, in terms of how long it takes to process a full four gigabytes of video, uh, I actually run it overnight uh, on an OCI cloud. Um, so it's about eight hours, roughly speaking, to do a full game. 
So you now I've got it kind of where it does it as a pipeline and it pushes it into the ADW. I can leave it overnight and run it, um, but it has taken a while to get to that point. Awesome. Um, I think Ahmad uh, Muhammad hit the, the same thought that I have. Have you thought about using a drone? And I once traveling becomes easier, I'm going to volunteer myself to fly mine for <laughs> one of your games. So I think that, droning that would be gets awesome. some cool shots. Um, but I like yeah. that idea, Ahmad. A great mind. Um, for the for the next question is. Um, was the prediction at the player level or was that at the team level? It was just a uh, missed for, for Francisco. Okay, so um, for the, the predictions in this demonstration, it's at team level. So it's um, who will win each game, basically. Um, and, and we, like I say, from a management perspective, um, I'm very much using that to look at games that are predicted to be extremely high um, win rate. Um, because maybe I'm looking at, can I put in a youth player or someone who's not had as many minutes um, and, and use that as an opportunity to get them involved in the game. So I've just flicked back to it. So this this is um, at team level. So um, the supervised learning was on home, away, or draw as the win. Um, I've not actually done any predictions on players um, in terms of like predicting if they score a goal or where they'll be on the pitch or anything like that. I've always kept it at team level. Um, I think in the grassroots football, we probably wouldn't go down to that player level. Awesome. Um, this one's from Avery Damar. Um, have you thought about using the GPS location data from the player individually, um, their own devices like a black chest uh, data, and then cross this with their positional data and et cetera, so that you can start to predict effectively during the match, aka tendencies over time in the game as their fitness goes on, or also that cross against other teams whom press or fall back um, or see how that impacts the individual results. I think Avery's a big soccer fan off of that, off that question. Yeah, I, I think that's an amazing question. Um, so 100% I would love to do that. And the biggest challenge is like the, the business question I set myself at the beginning was, could I do this for less than $500? So one of those GPS units is like going to blow my budget if I had to go and buy one of those. Um, but I would love to try it with that kind of data because I think it would really just marry up so well with this and, and definitely take it to another level. Um, I think if, if for example, semi-pro teams who do have that technology were to pick up what I'm doing and, and combine the two together, you're, the world's your oyster on where this, this could go. Like, nice. Um, I think we have three more questions. Um, okay. This one's from Ambili. Hi, Ambili. Good to see you. Um, Great, uh, great presentation today, Abby. Did you plot the descriptive passing networks graph also in OAC? Uh, no, so the, the passing networks of the, is essentially done in OCI in data, so in Python. Um, so I'll see if I can get that up. So the, essentially that's done in OCI as part of the pipeline, but then saved as a blob or an image in the ADW but with a match ID attached to it. So um, here you can see the Python for it. I plot it here. Um, I, I'm plotting it there so you can see it, but essentially that plot, instead of saving the figure, essentially what I'm doing is pushing that PNG as a blob to the ADW so that OAC can pick up the, the blob from the database. Um, so as part of the pipeline, it creates it in Python that, but then stores it in the database. I hope that answers the question. Super. Um, next one from Liam Thompson. Could this whole concept and analysis be transferred over to rugby? Uh, he's a uh, he's involved in a semi-local uh, or local semi-pro side, and he would love to advance their match analysis with this as well. I think actually could definitely go to rugby. It could go to basketball, and um, because the concepts are, are pretty much the same. Like I've borrowed concepts from basketball and brought them to soccer. So there is absolutely no way, like no reason this couldn't be moved to rugby and, and other sports. Um, so yeah, I, I think it would 100% transfer. Awesome. Um, and then the, the last question from Mario Gomez, um, how do you get info from other teams? Do you process all the games? Yeah, and, and that's the biggest challenge is at grassroots, it would be wherever me and my camera went to record it. Um, in terms of the WSL, it's all provided by a stats bomb. So I was able to do that. Um, you know, someone else has, has made that data available. But yeah, it, in terms of doing this for all games, essentially, it's where me and my camera go to record the game and, and then we process it. 
Awesome. Um, that was all the, the 20 questions. And I know um, we're at the top of the hour and Abby actually has to, to run off to go to practice now as well. So going from analysis of the team now to actually to implement it. So Abby, fantastic session. Um, really well received. And thank you for, for such a great uh, a session today. No problem. Thanks, guys. And we'll be sure to, to post this recording to andouc.org as well as their YouTube channel. So be sure to, to follow back up or connect with Abby on LinkedIn. Um, and she's happy to share more of her knowledge there as well. Yep, no problem, guys. I will make sure we get all of this information out to you. And yeah, we're going to make it available to everyone. Super. Thanks, everyone.